Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat Purnamudachate, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishyate, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Brihad Aranyakopanishad, Book 1, Madhukanda, Chapter 1, The Creation and Unity of All Beings, Section 1, Ashvamedha Brahmana, The Horse Sacrifice. Aum, Salutation to Brahman, Hiranyagarbha and the other sages forming the line of teachers who have handed down the knowledge of Brahman. Salutation to our own teacher. With the words, the head of the sacrificial horse is the dawn, etc., begins the Upanishad connected with the Vajasanayi Brahmana. This concise commentary is being written on it to explain to those who wish to turn away from this relative world, samsara, the knowledge of the identity of the individual self and Brahman, which is the means of eradicating the cause of this world, ignorance. This knowledge of Brahman is called Upanishad because it entirely removes this relative world together with its cause, from those who betake themselves to this study for the root sad, prefixed by upa and ni, means that. Books also are called Upanishads, as they have the same end in view. This Upanishad, consisting of six chapters, is called Aranyaka, as it was taught in the forest, Aranya and because of its large size, it is called Brihadaranyaka. Now we are going to describe its relation to the ceremonial portion of the Vedas. The whole of the Vedas is devoted to setting forth the means of attaining what is good and avoiding what is evil, insofar as these are not known through perception and inference, for all people naturally seek these two ends. In matters coming within the range of experience, a knowledge of the means of attaining the good and avoiding the evil ends is easily available through perception and inference. Hence, the Vedas are not to be sought for that. Now, unless a person is aware of the existence of the self in a future life, he will not be induced to attain what is good and avoid what is evil in that life. For we have the example of the materialists. Therefore, the scriptures proceed to discuss the existence of the self in a future life and the particular means of attaining the good and avoiding the evil in that life. For we see one of the Upanishads starts with the words, There is a doubt among men regarding the life after death, some saying that the self exists and others that it does not. Katupanishad 120 And concludes, it is to be realized as existing indeed, kata 6.13, and so on. Also, beginning with how the self remains after death, kata 5.6, it ends with some souls enter the womb to get a new body, while others are born as stationary objects, plants, etc., all according to their past work and knowledge, kata 5.7. Elsewhere, in this Upanishad, beginning with the man, self, himself, becomes the light, Sutra 4.3.9. It ends with, it is followed by knowledge, work, 4.4.2. Also, one becomes good through good work and evil through evil work, 3.2.13. Three, Again, beginning with, I will instruct you, 2.1.15. The existence of the extracorporeal self is established in the passage full of consciousness, that is, identified with the mind, etc. 2.1.16 and 17. Namaste. So this is part one of three parts 
of Shankaracharya's introduction to the first chapter of the first section of the first book of Brihadaranyakopanishad. And it is also an introduction to spiritual life in general, because the first supposition or the first thing you have to accept to have authentic spiritual life is the next life, the existence of a life after death in some form or other. Even the Buddha in the original Buddha suttas accepts that there is a next life. In fact, he asserts with great force and clarity that there is a next life and that you're going to be there to experience it. So you better take action now to optimize that next life. As Shankara says, to reduce the evil and promote the good in the next life. Not necessarily this life. Now, from the outset, we are talking about things that are beyond human perception. This is a very important point. Without some faith that these things are true, even though they are not verifiable empirically, you cannot even take the first step. Because the first step is to recognize that I live beyond this body's life. The gross body is temporary, about a hundred years, more or less, and it's finished. So if there is a life after death, it has to do with the subtle body. The gross body is made of earth, water, and fire. It's a heat machine. It burns food. It creates energy. But the subtle body is air and space, ether. This is why spiritual life can be communicated by words, because words are nothing but air and space. But they can communicate a transcendental vision, a structure, an ontology that goes beyond just the gross existence and takes into account mental phenomena, consciousness, and so forth. Trying to prove or establish or describe consciousness from a gross material point of view is a doomed <laughs> effort bound to fail because consciousness is fundamentally transcendental. See, they have it backwards. They have it upside down. They're saying that the body is the cause of consciousness. This is the other way around. Uh, that which is higher, which is more subtle, is the cause of that which is more gross. It is always that way. What is above, so below. The ancient hermetic axiom. So, this is well established in the Upanishads, the smaller Upanishads, like Katopanishad, which we did a series on way back when. <laughs> Kato means question. And the big question is, does the soul exist after death? And now who is the authority on that? Death itself, or Yamadev. Yamaraj, as he's sometimes called. He is death personified, and he is also here on Yagarbha. Hunger and the false ego, the collective false ego of all the beings in the universe. So, if the gross body is limited by time, and certainly in, in many other ways as well, then we ought to be able to see some evidence of that. And of course, the evidence is that not only our body, but the whole universe is always changing. And nothing remains the same for very long. 
as Terence McKenna put it, nothing remains, but nothing is lost. Everything is simply transformed and recycled into different, different forms again and again. So what is this reality then? You see, it can't be the absolute truth. It can't be the cause. It can only be an effect, a product. A product of what? Well, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> the subtle reality. The spiritual cause of everything, which is consciousness, or manifests as consciousness. What is consciousness? First, it's the awareness that I am aware, the consciousness that I am conscious. Then, it's consciousness of things, beginning with that truth. And then, Unfortunately, the tendency is for us to identify with the objects of consciousness and forget that we are actually the consciousness itself. Ever pure and self-renewed in every moment, huh? like a mirror, which uh, somehow cleans itself, <laughs> doesn't collect any dust. Huh? We are always conscious. But that eternal consciousness becomes covered over by consciousness of the body, the senses, the mind, and so forth. And we identify with that, and we think we are that. But that is subject to change and ultimately subject to death. So it cannot be a platform on which we can realize the ultimate truth or experience the ultimate enjoyment because anything that has a beginning has an end. Anything that is a product is an effect. And when the cause goes away, so does the effect. It's like a fire. When a fire goes out, what really happens is that simply the conditions that create the phenomenon called fire cease to exist. In other words, the cause goes away. The cause is the conditions that cause it, that make it happen. Fuel, oxygen, and heat. And with any of those three go away, the fire goes out. Well, of course, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> and neither does the soul when the body goes out. Uh, the fire of the body, the fire of digestion. Vaishvanara fire, as it's called. This is present everywhere. That's what vish, the root vish in Vaishvanara means. Present everywhere as hunger. A fire is hungry. It will burn any amount of fuel that you give it. It doesn't care, you know, because it's not a cause. It's not conscious. It's not a thing. It's just an element, a material element, fully conditioned by causes. So when any of those causes disappears, the fire goes out. Similarly, when the causes any of the causes, the multiple causes of this gross body are finished, this fire goes out. And what happens next? One is reduced to the subtle body. And remember, the subtle body is air and space. Vayu and Akasha, or prana, air moving in space. So one has to adjust oneself to the reality that we are already that. And we retain all the functions of that subtle body at all times. So even though it is not perceptible to the gross senses, it is, at least to a degree, perceptible by the mind. And that is what happens uh, when you get awareness of chi or prana, when you study qigong, 
Qigong is simply awareness of the prana, the qi, the qi, life energy circulating in and around the body, around the locus of the subtle body. But at least it's one step removed from the gross body. And it happens, you know, we've been talking about pratyahara, withdrawing the uh, senses from the gross body. And so what happens when you withdraw the sense of touch from the gross body, you get sensations of chi or ki or uh, life energy, vital energy, the Vaishvanara. So when this occurs, <clears throat> this is called yoga. Uh -huh. In the beginning, this is the beginning of yoga, of real yoga. <clears throat> when the senses including the sense of touch, become withdrawn from the gross organs that facilitate them on the level of gross reality. Uh, remember, earth, water, and fire. And they then become active in the subtle realm of air and space. <clears throat> so, to begin to understand the life after the death of the gross body, we can cultivate awareness of the subtle body by these different exercises. And the yoga asanas and, you know, qigong and <clears throat> Zen meditation and practices like that, anapanasati or vipassana, uh, these are meant to gain awareness and control of the subtle body, the pranas, the vital force. And that can help us establish faith in something even more subtle, which is the cause of everything. Consciousness. Because consciousness is equal to Brahman. And Brahman, on the experiential level, consciousness is the cause of everything. Without consciousness... Like, there ain't nothing. <laughs> so we have to accept that consciousness, at least for us personally, is experienced as the cause of all experience. Isn't it? Similarly, <clears throat> when this consciousness is also withdrawn from the gross senses and directed towards the subtle senses, which always exist, they're just covered over by the gross when that happens, you get a completely new view on life, an awakened view. And this is not yet full self-realization, but it's the first step on the road. So if we're going to look for a society or a company or an assembly or an association of beings who are at least on the path towards enlightenment, we want to look for those beings who have faith in the existence of the next life and some knowledge or some techniques on how to influence it to reduce the evil and enhance the good. And that is the topic of this introduction to the Upanishad. Aung Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>